So all the time I see people asking, how big are the biggest stars and how big can stars get? And that is a really interesting question and it's an exciting question because think about the big things. But actually I think a more interesting question is actually how small are the smallest stars? Because when you start to get down to the very low mass stars, you hit this really interesting gray area between what is a planet and what is a star. So essentially a star is any astronomical object that got hot enough to ignite nuclear fusion. So anything that's hot enough to burn hydrogen and turn it into helium. Now that only happens when you hit a very specific density. So the way that stars form is from huge big clouds of hydrogen gas. And what happens is that when those clouds start to clump together, there are areas that get denser and denser. So gravity tends to bring that gas together and cause it to get denser and denser. Now, as that happens, the densest parts start to heat up because of the amount of pressure that's pushing down on them from that gravity. Now that radiation can then escape in, in the form of heat and that's kind of pushing against gravity all the time. And so you can reach some sort of equilibrium. But for a star to form, the gravity has to sort of win over time. But eventually it will then get hot enough in the center of that gas cloud that's slowly contracting under gravity to ignite nuclear fusion, that hydrogen into helium process, which produces light and energy. So then you've got radiation pressure, which we call it the pressure of literally light particles coming outwards with lots of energy, pushing against gravity. So that then you hit an equilibrium where the star is happily burning lots of hydrogen fuel and it's no longer contracting under gravity and it will continue like that throughout its lifetime until it runs out of fuel. Now the interesting thing what happens is when you have those big clouds of hydrogen gas that are collapsing to form stars, you don't just get one huge cloud doing that. What happens is as the cloud contracts, you get denser areas and those tend to basically clump off. And so you can clump off and off and off in a chain until you get down to such small masses that actually as those tiny lumps of clouds of gas start to contract under gravity, you're never gonna hit a high enough temperature to ignite nuclear fusion to stop that gravitational collapse inwards. Now that limit of that mass is about 8% of the size of the sun. So we call the sun, it has a solar mass of one. So it's 0.08 solar masses. But it's not like there's nothing to stop that gravitational collapse at all. Eventually you hit something that we call electron degeneracy pressure, which is when the atoms are so closely packed together that electrons are literally repelling each other. They don't want to be in the same place as each other. And so that's what stops the gravitational collapse further. And you still end up with a stable object. Now these objects we call brown dwarfs, literally a dwarf star. And they're still very hot in the center where they're being held up by electron degeneracy pressure. So they tend to glow in the infrared, what we call a black body, very simple emission of radiation. But also there's some debate about whether the interior is actually hot enough for deuterium burning to happen. Now deuterium is what we call heavy hydrogen. So hydrogen usually is just one proton surrounded by one electron. Heavy hydrogen deuterium is a proton and a neutron in the nucleus surrounded by an electron. And you can fuse deuterium together with a proton to form helium-3, which is two protons and a neutron, and then get energy out as well. And I always think of deuterium as like Spider-Man 2 and you've got Dr. Octopus who's like get, trying to get nuclear fusion to work on Earth and he needs deuterium to do it. So these stars do have fuel available for them to burn, but they're clearly not the same as what we would call a main sequence star like the Sun, which is happily burning hydrogen into helium for light and heat and energy. So these brown dwarfs get up to about 8% of the mass of the sun, which still sounds like quite a lot of mass because the sun's like pretty heavy. But in fact, this is only 83 times the mass of Jupiter. So it raises this interesting question about these low mass stars and how different they really are to planets. So let's think about how we define a planet as well. There are three criteria that you need. The first is that it's not hot enough for nuclear fusion, which is why we don't technically class these brown dwarfs as planets. The second is that they need to be rounded under their own gravity. So, so massive that the gravity is evened out along the surface to give you something spherical where the gravity is equal along the whole surface. So that's why asteroids, comets, etc., are not classed as planets because they tend to be like lumpy, bumply, bobbly kind of objects. And the third thing is that the planet needs to have cleared its 
orbit around its star. So this is why Pluto isn't classed as a planet anymore because that it hasn't cleared out its orbit. You know, it's only something like 7% of the mass in its surrounding area compared to something like Earth, which is like 99.99999999% of all the mass in its area. So that's all very well and good for our own solar system, one star or the planets going around it. But what about when you think about other star systems out there, especially that the majority of stars in our own Milky Way our binary system, so our closest star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system, is actually three separate stars, Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. So if you have a binary system of stars, and one of those stars happens to be like a brown dwarf or lower mass than that, then what do you have there? Do you have two stars in a binary system, or do you have a star in a planet? Because some of the most massive exoplanets that are actually confirmed that we found are up to 33.7 Jupiter masses, that's HG 148284b. There's a 26.7 Jupiter masses as well, HD 13724b. So there's a lot of grey area here. There's no clear defined mass cutoff where you can say anything above this is a star and anything below this is a planet. Because what you also have, as well as brown dwarfs, is something that we call sub brown dwarfs. And sub brown dwarfs are where we think that it's not even hot enough for deuterium burning anymore. And we think that cutoff is around about 13 times the mass of Jupiter. So these are things that are less than 13 times the mass of Jupiter. They formed in the way that stars tend to form. They're not in orbit around a star at all. They could be isolated systems. And yet they're not planets and they're not stars either. We tend to call them isolated planetary mass objects or IPMOs, or people also tend to call them planemos as well, which I think is really cute. So it seems to be that the formation scenario here is what's differentiating between something that's a star, a planet, and a planemo. And there's a lot of overlap in the mass of those things. And yet we can still identify which is which based on where we find them and their formation scenario as well. So these planemos, people tend to refer to them as rogue planets because they don't belong to a star system. But another gray area is the fact that you could also refer to a rogue planet as something that's been ejected from a star system. So for example, the way we think the moon formed around the Earth is that another planet in the very early solar system crashed into Earth, turning everything molten and throwing around a load of rock around the Earth, which eventually caused us to form the moon. Now imagine instead that planet that we collided with was so much bigger than Earth, instead of you know around about the same size, we could have been ejected from the solar system by that collision. We would no longer have a star and the Earth would be a rogue planet wandering around the galaxy, orbiting around the center of the galaxy rather than around a star. So these are also rogue planets, these ejected planets, but now they've not formed like a star would, like a fragmenting gas star. They've actually formed around a star in a system and then been thrown out. So people have tried to estimate how many of these planemos and rogue planets there should be, which is not an easy calculation because we can't see these things. The way we see planets in our own solar system is because they reflect light from the sun. Same as in other exoplanet star systems, we sometimes see the light reflected from stars and we can see them that way. But these are rogue objects, some of which we will be able to see in the infrared, but not a lot because they're extremely faint against the bright background of stars in the Milky Way. But from considerations of simulations of planet formation and how many of the objects formed get thrown out in that, to considerations of if you have a giant gas cloud and it's fragmenting down into smaller and smaller pieces, how many of the small things you should end up with at the end, people have estimated that it's in and around the billions of planemos in the Milky Way, not orbiting a star, but just orbiting around the center of the galaxy itself. And before any of you get the idea, someone has already thought to ask, is it enough mass to account for dark matter in the Milky Way? And unfortunately, it doesn't come anywhere close enough to that amount of mass. So one of these things that we have detected is called OTS-44, and it has a mass of around about 11 and a half times the mass of Jupiter. So therefore that could be a planet or it could be a sub-brown dwarf, we're not entirely sure but it means that there's no nuclear fusion going on. It was detected in the infrared. It's about 560 light years away in the constellation of Chameleon. And the cool thing is, and the reason that we think we've been able to detect it is because it had an excess of infrared light for its size, 
because it has this very dusty disk around it. The same kind of disks that we see when there's planets forming around a star. So this is really cool because it means that you could get planets forming around a rogue planet. Now obviously that rogue planet is not burning any nuclear fusion so there would be no energy output in order to say support life on any of the planets around it. But again we're blurring the lines even more between planets and stars and rogue planets. Now the smallest planimo that we have ever found is three times the mass of Jupiter. It's called SORI70. It definitely needs a better name in my opinion. And it was found back in 2002 by Zapatero Osorio. And it's very, very close to the theoretical limit that we've come up with to say, this is the smallest thing that you can form if you have a cloud of gas fragmenting down to ever smaller and smaller pieces and collapsing to form these objects. Now that all comes from a consideration of the balance between gravity pulling inwards and then the heat in the interior of the object radiating energy outwards to give you that balance. So there's a point at which the gas actually becomes opaque as it hits a certain density. And what I mean by opaque is that literally the gas is opaque to the radiation that's trying to escape from the center to keep that equilibrium between radiation outwards and gravity inwards. And so that's the limit at which point you no longer will break off into smaller chunks of gas. But at that point, there's nothing counteracting gravity anymore. So you're just going to collapse whatever mass you have left down until you hit electron degeneracy pressure. And that's the smallest thing you can end up with. Now, from our understanding of how that happens and the balance between those forces, we've estimated that that's between one and 10 times the mass of Jupiter, which might not sound very precise, but in astronomy terms, that is really precise. It's within an order of magnitude. It's within 10 times. So the fact that we've been able to find something that's three times the mass of Jupiter is gonna let us put a much more stringent limit on these objects that form just like stars, but are actually planets. These girls fall like planimals, planimals. And the fact that Spider-Man, a very intelligent person, thought that he could drown nuclear fusion in the Hudson River. I was like, hmm, really Spider-Man, you wanna think this through? <laughs> rogue planets, planimos, it's like Star Wars Rogue One should actually have been called Star Wars, planimos. Planimos, planimos. I wanna show you guys my really cool earrings this month as well. Look at these guys. I mean, you know I love my space and science themed jewelry on this channel, but these absolutely Take the biscuit, say hi, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs>